still take a couple of minutes and wait until the speaker returns. In the meantime, um, welcome to the final session of our conference, of our symposium. Uh, my name is Thomas Radin. I'll be chairing this session. And it's my pleasure to introduce a philosopher with whom I've never really interacted in person, but of whom I've read a lot, and um, with whom I'm not really in agreement. And I can say that because he's just come to the bathroom and he'll be back in a couple of seconds. Um, so our final speaker, speaker is uh, Richard Boyd, who is Susan Lynn Sage Professor in the Sage School of Philosophy at Cornell University. And also, he's an adjunct professor at Lewis and Clark College. And as far as I understand it, that's only for the summer semester, apparently because the weather is more pleasant in Portland, Oregon than it is in Ithaca, New York at least in the summer. Um, Richard Boyd is a well-known proponent of realism, um, not only scientific realism, one of the main topics of today, but also moral realism, um, which he has defended in a paper from 1988, How to Be a Moral Realist, um, and scientific realism more in a paper uh, published in the journal Dialectica, 1989, What Realism Implies and What It Does Not, and also in a later Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on scientific realism from 2002. Um, he's very well known among philosophers of science and especially among philosophers of the special sciences like me, philosophy of biology, for his defense of a theory of natural kinds, which he calls the homeostatic property cluster theory of natural kinds. And this is one of the things that I've been thinking about and writing about a lot. And um, it's my great pleasure to actually be able to interact with Richard Boyd on this today. Um, homeostatic property cluster theory is become, has become the most popular theory among philosophers of science, and especially as special sciences of natural kinds, was defended um, in a number of papers over a period of 20, 25 years. Um, paper, for instance, that appeared in Philosophical Studies, 1991, Realism, Anti-Foundationalism, and the Enthusiasm for Natural Kinds, and a later paper in a book on species concepts in biology from 1999 called Homeostasis, Species, and Higher Taxa. And today we're going to hear about reconciling realism and neo-Kantian social constructivism for more correspondence, not less. Richard Boyd. I'm going to need a glass. Uh, oh, you already had a glass of water. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't so, use that when I used oh. that ah. ah, I don't know. People are trying to fake me out here. Um, OK. Um, so um, what I'm trying to do today is to try and build bridges. And the last time I talked to Kuhn, which was many, many years ago, shortly after he arrived at MIT, I gave what you might think of as a precursor to this talk, and he explained to me that he was actually a scientific realist. Um, and what I'm inclined to try to do is to, is to articulate a bridge building strategy that would, might make it true that he's a scientific realist. Okay, so, um, but I wanna talk about challenges to realism generally. Um, so I wanna focus mainly on, on broadly neo-Kantian challenges, but not just earlier and later Kuhn, but I'm interested in uh, people like, um, Putnam and Brandom, who want to reduce talk about truth uh, to considerations of uh, community norms. Okay, um, and I also want to talk a little bit about the pessimistic meta-induction. So I, I would look at a whole bunch of challenges to realism, and I want to suggest that if you understand what, the, what realists have been saying, these challenges are not very good, but you can rebuke, refute the challenges even more if you expand your conception of correspondence with the world rather than narrow it. Okay, so <coughs> uh, I'm now relying on, on um, uh, Paul's um, uh, work uh, uh, to characterize sort of standard neo-Kantian objections. Uh, there's ontological replacement. Uh, uh, there's a change in the extension assigned to different uh, concepts and categories, and that, that might challenge a realist view of those categories. And then uh, there's the question of perspectivicality. Um, Aren't scientific representations influenced by our social 
uh, cultural and biological nature, and doesn't that somehow compromise realism? <coughs> and the conclusion is there's no uh, con reason to posit a correspondence uh, conception of truth for scientific findings. And then there's, of course, the standard pessimistic meta-induction that says many empirically successful theories have been massively false, so why should you think that contemporary successful theories are true? And I take it that the central issue here is do we need something like a notion of correspondence truth in order to give an account of the success of science? Um, and I want to describe what I want to call basic everyday realism, which uh, um, is the, the sort of standard realist view out there. And I'm going to be claiming later about it that it's pretty good but can be made even better, but at the expense of positing more modes of correspondence with reality, not fewer. So. Um, Here's basic everyday realism for you. Um, methods work when background theories are true in, uh, approximately true along relevant lines, and most terms and concepts refer to or partially denote discipline-specific natural kinds or natural magnitudes or natural relations. Um, reference between terms and uh, these kinds or magnitudes is achieved uh, by causal relations between term users and of uh, the phenomena that they're getting at, um, and that phenomena of partial denotation and de denotational refinement, where the match gets better, are part of uh, what goes on in science, and terms, new terms are introduced, and sometimes terms fail to refer, and we find that out. Um, natural kinds, or magnitudes, whatever, are defined a posteriori by the properties or relations that underwrite successful induction and explanation involving the relevant terms. So if you think water is H2O, let's not talk about exactly how to understand that, but if you think there's an intimate connection between water and the way hydrogen and oxygen combine, um, th the reason you think that's the reference relation is it looks as though a lot of our inductive successes involving the term water were parasitic on the fact that almost all the things we called water happen to have mainly that chemical structure. Um, according to basic everyday realism, when scientists change classification, when they decide um, to expand the, the notion of acid to include proton donors or perhaps electron pair acceptors, um, their proposals represent a change in their conception of what it was they were getting at. So a change in classification is, is a proposal to revise an a posteriori definition that you previously had. Take the example of fungi. For a very long time, they were thought to be plants. Okay? When people decided they weren't on this view, this was not some sort of, merely some sort of conceptual change, but a better matching of biological terminology to historical claims. Um, and uh, according to basic everyday realism, uh, commensurability, semantic commensurability, is, is underwritten by re either referential univocity, the same term, different meanings in different communities, but the same referent, or by something more complicated like denotational refinement, where ambiguities get flushed with. So that's everyday realism. Um, and what I'm going to claim is that everyday realism is pretty good at explaining the phenomena cited by anti-realists and rebutting anti-realist arguments. But there are problems with everyday realism. For one thing, <coughs> if you think that, that methodological and semantic commensurability depend on exact univocity of terms, and having exactly the same reference, that seems implausible. So it would be better, better to have a view that doesn't build that in. And it also is the case that, uh, I think, when paradigms or theories or frameworks are research guiding, and when they're successfully research guiding, Everyday realism says that's because the terms refer and some of the generalizations or laws are approximately true. <coughs> it seems to me that it's plausible that features of a paradigm or a point of view could successfully guide research even in cases where the terms didn't refer. There might be some insight embedded in non-referring language. So if you think, I'm not sure this is right, um, but if you think that um, the development of uh, what's called idealistic morphology uh, in Germany in the, in the late 18th and 19th century was parasitic on Kantian views, and you think that those Kantian views are mistaken, that's a view that the critics of this proposal had, it could be that, that having a Kantian view provides you with insights 
about anatomy and physiology in systematic ways, even if a Kantian view is seriously mistaken. I'd like, I think we need an account of how uh, a paradigm or something can be re successfully research guiding uh, that doesn't involve just approximate truth. We need a notion of a paradigm or something like that being onto something, where that's a semantic relation where rate relations of reference are, are a special case. So what I'm going to argue for is that we should have a broader conception of correspondence-like semantic relations um, that includes reference and partial denotation as special cases. And I'm going to claim that that fully accommodates the insights of neo-Kantianism and the pessimistic meta-induction. But it's going to reject something central to early Kuhn and to many contemporary neo-Kantians that I'm, I'm sparring with in the States, namely the idea that there are community norms that you could appeal to if you wanted a substitute for correspondence truth. I think the idea that researchers, even within a sub-discipline, have shared coherent norms that could be uh, refer, uh, appealed to in, in grounding a, an alternative to correspondence truth is simply a, a philosopher's fantasy. I think that there are profound differences between the approaches of uh, scientists, and not merely in cases where you have to invoke pluralism, but I mean different laboratories <laughs> studying the same subject matter <laughs> with staffed by people with PhDs from the same department. Uh, I think there's a, an enormous amount of conceptual and, and norm variability. Uh, so I don't think that there's the coherent conceptual machinery which neo-Kantians or, or Wittgensteinians are inclined to apply, appeal to. Okay, so um, I just want to highlight the fact that I, uh, I know something about Paul's view and his disagreement with Howard. Uh, so, um, uh, so here's a quotation that I won't read. Um, one, one challenge to scientific realism uh, uh, arises from the fact um, that we change our classificatory conceptions when uh, there are scientific revolutions, and that's supposed to give rise to a problem about commonality of subject matter. Um, and uh, there's what I take to be, I think, a deeper problem because I, it's, I think it's a little bit philosophically tr trickier to handle it. There's a problem that we bring to scientific or philosophical or everyday research a whole bunch of cultural baggage. And you might think, well, if you've got that much baggage, the reality you're getting at by using it had better be somehow constructed by that baggage, otherwise you have no reason to think you're getting at any truth at all. I want to respond to that. Um, and then there are these pessimistic meta-inductions where a, a, a crucial issue um, is in uh, inventing the right theory. And so uh, Alex Rosenberg reminds us the hypothesis might be the most well-confirmed among the alternatives but it might not be approximately true. Your culture, your scientific culture, tells you what the relevant alternatives are. Suppose nothing near the truth, whatever truth is, right? I mean, prior to having a correspondence theory or a, some other kind of theory, if you, if, if you think you're truth-seeking, what if the truth is nowhere near the, any one of the alternatives? That could happen, right? Um, and um, uh, uh, Carl Stanford uh, points to all sorts of cases in which it looks as though the conceptual machinery you, you use in fundamental science might not be metaphysically right, even though the science is running smoothly. So that's a version of the pessimistic meta-induction. And I want to sort of respond to all that stuff. So here are some points that nobody disputes. Uh, social construction, in some sense, scientific theories in kinds and categories are social constructions. I mean, there's historical contingency in our inventing concepts. There are limits to social construction. Not every paradigm would succeed. Uh, if you want to cure cancer, you, you know, if you fund the establishment of a, a whole bunch of medical schools that teach that aspirin cures cancer, that will not make it the case that it does. Um, bad metaphysics. Many scientific theories get the fundamental physics wrong by later standards, that's for sure. Um, paradigm guidance, uh, research guidance, paradigms and frameworks um, even when they're wrong metaphysically, can fruitfully guide research, that's for sure. Um, and we do change our standards of classification and measurement under kind or, or magnitude or, or um, uh, relation terms when we change fundamental theory. And that fact is seen as an argument 
by some people for realism and by some people <laughs> for neo-Kantian anti-realism. Realists want to say the changes in taxonomic practices amount to discoveries of what the real essences are, or sometimes amount to the discoveries of what the real essences are of the phenomena we're studying. So it turns out that if you used to think that fungi were, um, were plants, um, more recent biology tells you what it is to be a plant, and it's to be in a clay that fungi aren't in. So we have a more complete understanding of what planthood really is, and that's why we change the classification. So on the realist reading, we're doing exactly what Locke thought we couldn't do. We, we are classifying things by real essences, and what could be more realist than that? But on the other hand, if you're a neo-Kantian anti-realist, you might say that uh, changes in classification are an example of ontological replacement. They're, they're a matter of changing the metaphysics in a way um, that dictates that we, we think of the metaphysics of the world as somehow depending on the framework in which the research is conducted. Um, so I want to say that given all these points of agreement, we should be able to reconcile stuff. Um, and that the key arguments for realism have to be properly understood. They involve explaining the reliability of scientific theories, not, not um, the reliability of particular theories. I'm going to suggest we need what I'm going to call an accommodationist theory of reference, um, which treats uh, uh, commensurability, commonality of reference, uh, as a matter of a complex scientific achievement. People have to work hard to figure out whether, how and in what way they're talking about the same thing. But I want to suggest that we can have an expanded conception of, of correspondence with reality that actually makes the case for realism better at the expense of what might look like metaphysical extravagance. And um, I claim that we can accommodate most of the sort of neo-Kantian insights if we do that. So let's talk about what the standard argument for realism is rather than the standard realist view. Um, a lot of people cite the no miracles argument of Putnam, and what I've discovered to my surprise is that many people don't know what it is. There are two no miracles arguments that you could, that, there are two, two arguments that might be described that way. One of them goes this way, here's a scientific theory and it's empirically adequate. So it would be a miracle if it weren't approximately true. Here's another no miracles argument. The methods we use in some, pick your favorite science, chemistry or something, um, the methods we use there are profoundly theory dependent as a way of identifying good predictive instruments, so theory dependent that it would be a miracle if those methods were reliable if the background theories weren't in some respects approximately true. Um, the first of these arguments is stupid. You know, give me your, give me your favorite true, whatever you think that is, uh, uh, empirically adequate theory, and I can invent an obviously false theory that makes exactly the same prediction. So the inference from this theory is empirically adequate, so it's very probably approximately true, is silly. Um, the actual argument for realism and the arguments that move logical empiricists towards realism were arguments from methodology. For example, if you, if you were initially an operationalist about measurement, and then you discovered that scientists really could improve their measurement procedures, and you, you, you couldn't account for that if you thought measurement was merely conventional. It's a way of moving towards realism by trying to explicate the reliability of methods, not trying to uh, explain the predictive success of one theory. So the actual argument uh, for realism, the better one, number two, uh, treats theoretical considerations as projectability judgments and treats them as evidential. The idea is you're making use of what you take to be previously acquired knowledge to decide what the relevant choice space is when you're addressing a scientific question. It implies um, a strong anti-foundationalism, and it requires a distinctive uh, a realist approach to kinds. And um, I just want to indicate a little bit about how common it is for people now who are contending with realism to assign to, to realists argument one. So um, these, are, these are all Kyle Sanford stuff. Um, Stanford says about 
the no miracles argument. Their most influential argument for this position is the abductive explanation of the miracle argument in Hillary Putnam's memorable phrase, the success of science would be a miracle if scientific theories were not true, more formally, that the approximate truth of our current scientific theories provides at least the best um, and uh, perhaps the only explanation uh, that of the empirical success that those theories enjoy. That's not the argument. <laughs> I mean, it really isn't. Um, the, uh, uh, the argument is actually a, 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 essentially a transcendental one. Uh, it says, we have these, these theory-driven standards of evidence which appear to be reliable, and the only good explanation, the only good justification for thinking they're reliable is you think that the theories that lie behind them are, are onto something. That's a different argument, and it turns out that it matters that it's a different argument. Um, okay. Um, so, if scientific realist in, inferred from the empirical success of theory to its approximate truth, and if the following sort of referential hypotheses um, are always rejected that the that substantival ether referred to electromagnetic fields, that caloric referred to conductive heat transfer, that dephlogisticated air referred to oxygen, or that phlogiston refers to oxygen, or that differentiated chromatin refers to differentiated gene expression. If you reject all of those as naive, and if realists believe that scientists never suffer from the problem of unconceived alternatives, and if realists think that scientific theories get, scientists get fundamentally, fundamental theories fundamentally right at the metaphysical level, well, if all those things are true, then scientific realism is in trouble because the, the history of the success of science doesn't look like that. Um, but that's not what scientific realists say. And I want to emphasize what the basic realist conception is of how scientific knowledge is assessed. And this addresses questions that I tried to bring up uh, from the floor earlier. As a matter of description of practice, um, in a research community at a time, a theory counts as well confirmed if it's projectable by current standards, if it's favored over projectable alternatives by the, by the relevant evidence, and if the relevant evidence was gathered so as to control for artifacts suggested by projectable theories, where projectability is plausibility given the current scientific theory. What we're doing is, op well, this is Kuhn, uh, we're operating from a choice space that's determined by our current theoretical conception. The, if it works out that one of, the, one of the theories that answers the current question seems to work much better than the others, and if we think that um, the relevant observational or experimental studies have controlled for projectable theories about artifacts, then that's what counts as evidence for the theory. And this means that we're counting theoretical plausibility or projectability or simplicity or harmony or coherence or unification as evidential. Our actual practice takes it as part of the evidence in favor of an alternative answer to a scientific question that it coheres <coughs> well with the current background theory. It doesn't, our practices don't treat that as definitive evidence for two reasons. One, we know the science is fallible, but more often uh, there are several So if you ask why these rules are reliable, their reliability is utterly historically contingent. The basic methodological rule is to choose from theories recommended by the best current theories. It presupposes that often among the projectable answers to a scientific question that are actually invented and proposed, there will be one pretty close to the truth. This rule is reliable when it is reliable, not because the, the current theories are current, but it's reliable when and only when current theories are onto something about the world, represent the structure of the world in such a way that when they guide us in our choice of alternative answers to a scientific question, the guidance is pretty good. So what's true is that the theory dependence of methods is a matter of having our research horizons constrained by our current best guesses. And having our research horizons so constrained is reliable 
just under the circumstances where our current best guesses are a pretty good way of constraining theory invention. That's utterly non-foundational. I mean, it's, there have been whole disciplines of study of, of, of human difference, uh, of racial differences in intelligence in, uh, in humans will do. For an example, we have an entire discipline founded on presuppositions that turn out not to be true. Uh, and you can, if you're in one of those disciplines, you can systematically be conscientious and do good research forever, and you'll be um, bounded away from the truth because the conjectures you take seriously won't include something near the truth. Okay, and <clears throat> for semantics, you need a semantics for scientific language that makes it possible for this kind of um, guidance of research to take place. Um, so realism is an explanatory explanation for the reliability of scientific methods. It posits approximate alignment via approximate truth between scientific theories and concepts and methods, and whatever causal factors there are in the world that determine the properties of the phenomena under study. It explains um, that alignment with a, with a theory of reference in natural kinds, where kinds are social constructions invoked to explain successful induction and explanation. Now, here's what's important. In order, for those, in order for that explanation to work, it's required that these natural kinds be social constructions. What we're trying to do is to explain the success of an actual human enterprise by a positing approximate ali uh, alignment between the conceptual and representational machinery of the humans <laughs> and um, factors uh, causing important factors in the world so that, so that their theories can guide research. It has to be the case <laughs> that on this view, um, natural kinds, categories, whatever, are social constructions. It couldn't be otherwise. Um, on this view, reference is an ongoing process of trying to fiddle to make that ac accommodation work better. And um, It'll turn out that reference of a term is not mainly determined by the most fundamental laws and concepts, contrary to a position that Kuhn at one time seemed to have advocated apparently following Carnap, but we can talk about that. Um, okay, so what I'd like to, I'm gonna, I, I have more things to say than I can squeeze in, but given, given talk about pluralism, I wanna sort of emphasize something. I wanna talk about how to think about natural kinds and reference, and this will be the old kind of realism, and I'll tell you how to soup it up if I have time at the end of the talk, but I want to talk about the semantics of non-human languages. I'm going to follow Quine in natural kinds. I'm talking about non-human animals. Let's talk about an actual case. So uh, Paul Sherman and his associates have studied alarm calls in Belding's ground squirrels, and Belding's ground squirrels make two different sorts of chirps. One of them, call it A, uh, is uh, an alarm for aerial predators, and another one, call it B, uh, refers to terrestrial, uh, call it T, uh, <laughs> refers to terrestrial predators. And uh, this semantics is part of an explanation of how the ground squirrels achieve something, namely of, uh, avoiding predation. Um, so why is it that, that alarm call A refers to aerial predators? Is it the case that that these squirrels issue, issue this chirp all, always and only when they see an aerial predator and the answer is no, there are lots of false, neg false positives and some false negatives, and similarly for T, but A is produced more often for aerial predators than for terrestrial ones, T is produced more often for terrestrial predators than for aerial ones, and the fact that that's so and the associated differential escape behaviors that these organisms exhibit when they hear the sound explains how they achieve something. Okay, well, I want to say the theory of natural kinds is a generalization on this. We're talking about e explaining a certain kind of achievement in terms of a, an alignment between a signaling system and causal phenomena in the environment. So here's the rough and ready sketch. Uh, if you had a disciplinary matrix and you had a bunch of terms in it, uh, the reference relation, if it's determinate, I'll claim that that's pretty infrequent, but when you have determinate reference, what you're gonna have is uh, each term corresponding to, a, to a, a family of properties where that correspondence makes two things true. By and large, the use of the term TI will be regulated by the actual occurrence of the uh, members of the family FI and the fact that there's that kind of regulation 
will explain the inductive or explanatory successes of the scientists in question. So um, the reason why the term sulfuric acid refers not to containers that have the word sulfuric acid on it, that there's a, uh, lots of times the word sulfuric acid is used, is prompted by seeing a sign. Well, but it's actually a particular chemical composition. Why? Well, because the, the fact that the use of the term sulfuric acid is regulated by these labels is not a deep explanation of why that term functions successfully in chemistry. You need, okay, you got the point. Um, so let's ask about cultural specificity and so and social construction. Let me let me back up. Okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to see how much I can skip. Uh, so both Hoynig and Huna and on behalf of Kuhn and Putnam and Brandom um, emphasize that, that um, there is such a thing as participating in the norms of a community. And the question is, in addition to acknowledging that scientists do that, do you have to make some reference to the notion of truth or correspondence um, uh, of features of their community's theories or, or concepts? Um, and um, I, I, so I, do, you need, do you need to think that, that scientific terms often refers to, to real natural kinds? And I want to just emphasize one point in this slide so I can move forward. Um, all the concepts in science are social constructions. That's how we got them. We constructed them, right? And on the view I'm defending, natural kinds are social constructions. They are, uh, the theory of natural kinds is a theory about how we've succeeded, in, to the extent we have, in sorting stuff in ways that are revealing of the kinds of causal structures that we're trying to investigate. So natural kinds are going to be discipline relative social constructions on the view I'm defending. Does that make them unreal in the way secondary qualities are unreal? Well, secondary qualities aren't unreal anyway, but let's not talk about that. We are the only species such that we think that systematic relation to that species is ontologically deflating. Okay, when I talked about the referential semantics of, sem of, of alarm calls in building ground squirrels, I talked about aerial predators and terrestrial predators. Well, I didn't mean aerial predators on just anything. Dragonflies are aerial predators, some of them are aerial predators on inse uh, other insects. I meant aerial predators on Belding's ground squirrels. Oh, so that's a category defined in terms of a particular rodent. Does that make that category irreducibly rodential and thus not real? No, it doesn't. The ground squirrels are real, the predation is real, the predators are real, the category predator, aerial predator on Belding's ground squirrels is a perfectly real category. Well, fair play for humans. <laughs> Categories that are defined in terms of the way in which our systematic practices are connected to the world are, as, are equally real. <laughs> I mean, we're, it, what everything about secondary qualities, um, our scientific projects are as real as predation on ground squirrels. What's the real content of the idea that these kinds have to be mind independent? Well, um, the line I want to take, which I'm not going to develop here, is what I, what I call the, the no non-causal contribution. Human social practices make no non-causal contribution to social structures. Okay. There are lots of social, the, the causal structure, lots of causal structures in the world that are there because of us. In fact, many of them are there because of our theories. For example, graduate programs that study the theories are real phenomena in the world, and, and their, their form depends on our theorizing. But we, need, we are unlike, we like ground squirrels, don't have any special way of, con of contributing. There's no special philosophical way of contributing to the causal structure of the world. The sense in which our kinds and categories have to be independent of us is the, the, the very same way in which the categories uh, we use to explain ground squirrel behavior have to be independent of ground squirrels in the sense that ground squirrels don't have some sort of magic metaphysical capacity to uh, create predators or whatever. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to skip around a bit. Uh, one idea which is not 
prominent in the later coup, but is important in early coup, but it's also important in Brandon and Putnam. It's the idea that there are coherent community norms, and perhaps that they define our concepts in some important way. And um, I'm just going to say here what I actually said 15 years ago in this very auditorium. There are whole scientific disciplines such that the terms in those disciplines refer to real phenomena, whatever references, this is pre-philosophical, refer to real phenomena despite the, diff the descriptive machinery deployed in those theories rather than because of it. The example I gave 15 years ago, which I'll uh, I publish, you can send me an email and I'll send you a paper, uh, is the contemporary evolutionary psychology in the States where uh, people are studying real phenomena you know, mate choice, bargaining, uh, social accommodation, shopping behavior, all those, all those things are real and the terms refer to them. But the inferential principles that define that discipline involve inferences from evolutionary scenarios to con psychological conclusions, which would be an embarrassment to any behavioral ecologist who wasn't a member of this particular clique. So the, the inferential and, and, and conceptual commitments that, that are involved in joining this community are ones such that if that were all there were to their vocabulary, the terms wouldn't refer. <laughs> but they refer because of the efforts of other people who have a less compromised methodology. So we, in, in talking about descriptive elements in reference, we don't have to think that fundamental laws or fundamental principles are always what are decisive in establishing reference. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Okay, um, now, um, I want to claim first that realist accommodation works pretty well in, in accommodating the kinds of facts which are taken to be uh, underwrite anti-realism, and then I'm going to very, very quickly sketch what I take to be uh, an important extension of, of realism. So, um, this realist accommodation agrees with, with neo-Kantian constructivism in predicting changes in meanings and also putative extensions of natural kinds. It says that will happen. And it predicts that understanding and commensurability will involve theoretical and conceptual and methodological challenges. Uh, okay. It implies that scientific kinds and categories are in a certain sense, uh, I, I, I've got to watch, <laughs> are in a certain sense artifacts. But it differs from neo-Kantian constructivism um, in, in, in adopting a sort of non-foundationalist but realist account of the epistemology of cultural and biological dependent methods. Those methods are reliable exactly under the circumstances in which, as a matter of fact, the concepts and categories that we have as a result of our history pretty well map some of the phenomena that, we, that we're trying to find out about, pretty well map the underlying causal structure, and give us good advice about what to try next. Um, this approach fully rationalizes as scientific discoveries many changes of meaning and putative extensions because it, when scientists decide that fungi aren't plants, that's not like sort of a con you know, just a conceptual change. It's a hypothesis about what plants, what, what the things we call plants had fundamentally in common. The current conception is, is that, that uh, those kinds of commonalities are matters of being members of a clade. <laughs> and it turns out that uh, fungi aren't, the, it, a clade that contains plants and fungi goes back too far. So it treats conceptual revision as sometimes simply a discovery, scientific, ordinary scientific discovery about how our practices align with the world. Okay, uh, what I want to do is to talk about ways in which you should go beyond uh, thinking of the representation of the world in, in paradigms as being just a matter of uh, referring expressions and approximate truth. Uh, here I'm following an idea that I got from Amundsen's uh, The Changing Role of, of the Embryo in Evolutionary Thought, and here's, he, he talks about cautious realism, but here's, here's my formulation, and I'll give you one example, then I'll quit. Here's the realist formulation. Reliably repeatable regularities are, al are always or almost always underwritten by some underlying causal factors and methodologically successful representations of such regularities and methodologically successful methods for identifying them are always or almost always formulated in terms that are somehow or other aligned with the relevant underlying causal factors. 
factors that are somehow or other onto something. And I'm going to say the key correspondence notion is of something being onto something. The alarm call A is onto aerial predators. That's not a matter of conceptual analysis. It's not a matter of how ground squirrels would, re would, would, would respond to twin Earth uh, uh, experiments. It's a fact about what they're sensitive to. Uh, and that can happen even when um, the uh, alignment isn't reflected in, a course, in something that looks like clean correspondence approximate truth. Um, the example, let me give one example. I'll give another one if you give me, if someone asks me a question, I'll give you one more. I want to talk about how, what realism looks like if you adopt this view. So many people nowadays are uh, eliminativists about species. Um, with respect to the category species, uh, the, the options in the literature are that there's a unique reference, a, a unique layer in the, in the Linnaean hierarchy, the species level, and that there's a pluralist view. Um, a, a, think of Kitcher who thinks the term species partially denotes different kinds of things. And then there's an eliminativist view that um, Arashevsky and, and, and Mishler both defend, according to which there just isn't a species level. There, the, the picture that there's <coughs> one kind of evolutionary commonality that's species specific is just wrong. Okay, now what do people who say that think? Here's what they think. They think that there are many evolutionarily stable, explanatorily important, here's the jargon, islands in morphospace. <laughs> um, ways of being a plant or animal or a fungus or whatever that are evolutionarily stable and causally important. They think that the use of the species term, the category species, went with a hypothesis that there's a smallest size of these islands in morphospace that are the most fundamental. They think that's false. They think that, that there are islands in morphospace of differing sizes, but that no principal distinction goes with the category species. That's their view. Okay. I think their view is correct, but it doesn't matter. Is it an anti-realist view about species? Well, it, maybe it's an anti-realist view about species, but whatever that, but it's not an anti-realist view. Their view is that our use of biological terminology systematically corresponded, and successfully so, to stable islands in morphospace. But that a particular conjecture, namely that there were the smallest such islands, that is smallest temporally as well as, as spatially, that were evolutionarily important, turned out to be a mistake. They think that historically the term species was used to refer to pretty small islands in morphospace under the mistaken assumption that that corresponded to a, 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 a clean category. Well, that's a correspondence conception. When Darwin talked about the evolution of species, he was talking about the evolution of some small chunks of historically important morphospace. space. But the term species itself probably doesn't refer. That's a realist view. The term <laughs> realist about species is misleading. And this is going to happen all over the place. Terms like gene, homology, organism, population, belief, almost all those terms stand a pretty good chance of not strictly speaking referring. But the hypothesis that they don't refer is not the hypothesis that they aren't, that they didn't correspond to reality in an important way that revealed to us something about the structure of the world. It's a hypothesis that the relation to reality was messier. And the hypothesis that I want to put forward, I'll, I'll stop now. Uh, the hypothesis that I want to put forward is that reference is actually better understood as an ongoing process of fiddling with, with language and concepts in hopes of gluing it to the world in discipline-specific, useful ways. And here's the pluralism. There's absolutely no reason to think uh, that that shouldn't be done in a pluralist way um, because we're not, well, we're pretty good at making conjectures, but we're not perfect. Um, one way of looking at this is to look at the literature in psychology and economics and evolutionary theory on cooperation and ask yourself as a philosopher, how many contributions could I make in cleaning up the, the language and concepts these people are using? The answer is lots. Okay, and, and it's pluralist all over the place, but it's not that they're not studying real phenomena. 
okay, it's that the relationship between their term altruism, for example, and patterns of behavior is really messy. But it's still some kind of correspondence that needs to get sorted out. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we've got time for questions. Asok Chang. Thank you very much. I, I find it really uh, an attractive way of thinking about things like natural kinds. I'm just wondering whether there's a way of making that notion of correspondence you're using uh, more precise. So one way to ask the question is, I don't know, can the phrase you're on to something be translated into German? I, I couldn't imagine how to translate that to Korean, which is what I also ah. speak. Uh, another way to put it is to say, uh, from the neo-Kantian point of view, would you object how, and how much uh, if we <laughs> said, right, if we said the correspondence you're talking about is between a term and actually a section of the phenomenal world rather than to something in the world itself. Okay, okay look, um, I, I gave a version of, of, of this talk at the third meeting of the German Society for Analytical Philosophy, and um, I, it was more, it was closer to Kuhn, and all sorts of people came up to congratulate me on being a Kantian. Let me, <laughs> let me, let me make it exactly clear. The reality, I, the, the, the crucial idea here is there's causation in the world, and the explanation for the way ground squirrels survive is that their conceptual and perceptual apparatus detects Causal properties in the causal reality out there. Okay, so this is as non, this is both non union and non kantian So I really think that, I think that you can't, I don't, I don't think that there's any way of not using overtly causal language to describe the <laughs> phenomena, that's the wrong term to use here, um, the things going on <laughs> such that, um, conceptual and perceptual resources in humans, but also in non-humans, have to be aligned with them in order for uh, projects to succeed or, pre or predators to be avoided. So I would certainly, uh, I wouldn't go Kantian in the way you suggest. Um, I don't know how to, I, I don't know any Korean, and I, my German is limited to reading menus, so I don't know how to say being onto something. What I think one can do, it, I, I'm trying to do this, um, is, to, is to fill out what it means for uh, a signaling system to be aligned with causal structures in such a way that some achievement is explained. And I'd like to have that work out so that it covers cases of non-human animal signaling and covers cases of determinate reference in, in the human case when there are such cases, but where it portrays our ordinary referential life as really Here's another term I don't know how to translate into German, winging it. We're, we, have, we have concepts that are, and, and terms that are loosely hung on the causal structure of the world, and the, the connection is, is good enough that it can guide science, but one of, the, one of the projects internal to a discipline is to sort of hang those ornaments on reality in a more determinate way. I think the case where a scientific term has a determinate reference is a, is a I think it happens, but I think it's, it's a, a fairly rare special case because so many scientific terms, well, take, take the, the, the key example is homology in, in biology. People are able to recognize homology and they have some idea what it is, but only in beginning biology classes does anyone give a definition that they think is, I think, similarity due to common descent. Well, that's the similarity of what sort do in what ways to come to sense. So, so um, uh, Gunter Wagner now has a, a new book out on, on homology and evolvability. And you know, he makes it clear, he has a particular view, but he makes it clear that this is a concept which essentially no one understands. But there is, there are, either there's a single phenomenon of homology or what's, what's likely to be true. Is there a family of closely related phenomena the term probably partially denotes? Uh, but we can, we can get away with using it because it's, on to, it, it, it's aligned with, the world, with evolutionary factors, developmental factors, well enough 
to facilitate research. And here, I think this, this stuff about pluralism comes to the fore because um, the big move in evolutionary biology is to supplement population genetics with developmental studies, and that was actually achieved it, it, by a certain kind of forced cooperation. I mean, the people who wanted to, uh, to introduce developmental things had to fight for NSF funding for about two decades, but now there is cooperation, and that's pluralism. Okay, one other question, Howard Sankey. I just, I'm sorry, I haven't talked to Mike. All right. Um, this is, I actually want Paul to answer the question that you were tacitly raising for him about Kuhn and the reading of Carnap. Um, you, you, you were speculating that Kuhn had some views that must have come from Carnap in the late 1950s. Right. Uh, my speculation is that Kuhn hadn't read any Carnap at all. Uh, and I just want to know whether, uh, what Paul thinks. What's so striking is that the, that the argument on pages 101 and 102 of the first edition of, of Structure might as well have been copied from empiricism, semantics, and ontology in that it seems to say that the semantics of theoretical terms is determined unrevisably by the fundamental laws. Now, Maybe he didn't mean, I mean, I know we can talk about what he had in mind. Uh, I'm trying to talk about a way in which, uh, the, let me tell you what I think Kuhn thought when he thought he was a realist, during those episodes where he thought he was a realist. I, I think where he, what he may have been on to is that the way in which successful paradigms or whatever are aligned with the world is messier than talk about truth and approximate truth can reveal. It, it's hairier than that. So I'm offering that as a, something he might have meant but in any event, what he actually wrote, when I read it, I had just read Carnap, I had thought, gee, this has got to be Carnap because it's so close. We still have time for one or two questions. Paul Heuningen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dick. Uh, I, I can't really ask you a question that concerns the whole of your talk because right, I, cheated. I, I have to read it first. Because, yeah, well. uh, yeah, and I will. Uh, but I have a little one, a little question. Okay. Uh, when you said, um, when we have changes of classification, then this may be just on the middle of the anti-realist. He says, yes, you see, so we don't have any right classification. And then he says, yeah, yeah, that could be read also in a different way, that the realist says, okay, the class change of classification means now we discovered real essences. And uh, if that's an argument, you can pull that trick only once. Arguments. I'm sorry. Take if you pull that trick no, no, the I'm second sorry, time, tell me, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't. It, 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 my hearing aids may not be good enough. No, Describe said, the trick again, and then I can. No. The point was, you said that the realist will interpret the specific case about fungi. He will say, or she will say, well, now we discovered the real essences of the fungi, and I'm saying this move. Uh, you can pull this trick only once. Because in the second time, when you say the same after the second change of classification, everybody will laugh at you. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, and uh, that's why uh, this was a talk I was abbreviating. Here's what I think, here's what I think reference actually, the uh, scientific reference actually is. I think it's a, a series of, um, when it works, it's a series of changes in linguistic practice whose tacit aim is aligning con uh, concepts more closely with underlying causal structures. So I want to say that, that when, in nice cases where, where people aren't being irresponsible, when they, when they propose to change the definition of plant, okay, uh, what, what we should think of them as doing is saying, we had a conception of what plants had in common. It turns out that the features, the plant, that what we used to call plants that, that, that they had in common that are important evolutionarily are a different, are, are given Horizontal dream transfer is much more important than anybody realizes. 
only successful when they connect with the world in some useful way. And uh, it seems to me that that um, that you know theories of well theories of truth, uh, both correspondence theories and non-correspondence theories, have have been ways of acknowledging <laughs> that uh, when theories or concepts are useful, it's because they they're somehow aligned with the world. And what I don't what I don't see is why there's any temptation not to think of that alignment is some kind of, plays a role in some kind of causal explanation of successful surveys. And the people who put chairs in here probably read something that, that it had whatever the German is for chair, and the fact that, that that word is used around these kinds of objects and not park benches is part of what explains why we don't have park benches in here. Okay, so it seems to me that, that it's in a way mysterious why anyone shouldn't want to talk about correspondence truth unless they fall for the Putnam view. So what goes with that is thinking there's a single unique vocabulary and a single ontology, but as far as I can tell, no scientific realist ever defended that view. So. Okay, correspondence truth is an excellent topic to continue to discuss over drinks, which we're going to do now. It's the only good topic to discuss over drinks. We're having a reception in the basement. Of course, everyone is invited, but first, um, let's thank Richard Boyd for his talk. Yes, um, um, hello everyone. Uh, you may have seen me already. Um, I'd uh, express a few words of thanks. Uh, and the first one is, of course, to the organizers. Uh, this is mainly as far as I could see from the program. I don't know who it really did the work. I mean, Simon is uh, certainly involved, and Helmut, they are written there, but certainly other people were also involved. So thank you very much. This was a wonderful event. Uh, you brought wonderful people here. Uh, and this is then uh, the, the second round, so to speak. Thank you to my good old friends, old good friends, um, Howard, Martin, uh, Dick, uh, and Hassock for coming here for this occasion. I mean, when I saw that uh, on, the, on the poster, I thought, wow, my people made the right choice to pick youth for this was just wonderful. Then I may widen the circle a little, so it's uh, not only because I'm leaving here and uh, therefore it's not only that I thank uh, these two, of, uh, especially these two, but I really uh, want to express my gratitude uh, to all those students and collaborators of mine here in Hanover because we are having still a wonderful time. I mean all of my colleagues now and also the older ones, um, they were not just very good philosophers, but they are really good friends and really good people. I mean, no one of them was really deeply neurotic, making my life very hard. From time to time, a little. I'm not the easiest person myself, so, but it went on extremely well. And sometimes when I told my wife again, coming back from Hanover, I mean, she could listen even after a while because, well, I'm so happy when I'm here. And uh, so this is the same. So I thank all of you, all my PhD students, and I know you did not ever ha always have a, nice, a light, uh, easy time with me, uh, but you certainly learned something from it, and I sometimes also learn something from it. So thank you very much to all my students and collaborators, um, um, and some of them, many of them are here now. Now then I widen the circle once more, because all this is only possible uh, because the University of Hanover made a very, uh, how shall I put it, bold move in hiring me and giving me that big amount of money uh, such that I could really move things, as Howard and I used to say, we are the movers and the shakers of what goes, of what was going on, and of course the, the incommensurability conference was one of these events, which was just made possible if you have enough finances, then you can start early enough because before you know where the third party money, uh, third party money uh, will come in. So uh, this was very important. And um, uh, are there still? Yes, there are still people. Uh, from the Presidium, and uh, I want to uh, personally say one thing is extremely important, that is the amount of trust that I always, really invariably, always got from the, uh, from the President and the Vice President. When I said, I think we should do this and that, there was never, ever mistrust uh, from the people from the uh, uh, Presidium. 
And this was extremely important because, as uh, the president already said, we had many difficult uh, situations, but I was always sure when I come with something reasonable, the uh, presidium will always support me. And the president once said, uh, look, um, Heuningen, either we fall together or we, we pull it through. And this was extremely important in an otherwise sometimes hostile environment. And this is something I know does not happen in all universities. You must have one unit where you can really trust. It may be the faculty. In my special case, it was uh, the presidium. And that was extremely important. And it did give me the strength uh, to pull that through. And also, this uh, process now of the new institute is something which was really backed up by the uh, presidium all the time, invariably, with no failure. And this is, I'm really thankful, because that made the university of uh, Hanover Leibniz University really a home for me, where I was willing to put in all my strength and give the best, and thanks very much to the presidium. Um, well, there's something else, but that's smaller. It's my family. And I thank you. Um, it's not that easy. Um, I've been away for 17 years, every week almost, or during the term at least, and it was uh, not easy for my kids when I was uh, leaving. First, I mean, 17 years ago, you were five, right, Alexander? And uh, my daughter was 12, and my wife had not easy times all the time, um, but with uh, well, negligible problems that always worked out the support, and we ne didn't never quarrel about it, of course. Um, but it was not completely easy, and uh, without my family and the support, I could not have done that either. Um, so um, I'm leaving now Hanover, and I have a, a deep sense of gratitude because so many people, um, the institution, but also the, the people themselves as individuals, they contributed uh, to make my Hanover experience uh, an experience uh, to which uh, until, the rest of my, uh, until the end of my life I will think back really with gratitude. So thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Let's have a glass of wine now. It's downstairs.